Hi everyone, welcome back. Today we're going over chapter two, and this is a review of chemistry. So all life, all living things are composed of matter, and matter is anything that takes up space and has mass. Elements are types of matter that have specific chemical and physical properties. Elements can't be broken down into smaller substances, and we usually use chemical symbols to represent each element. For example, we use S to represent sulfur and CA to represent calcium. The most common elements that are found in all living organisms are carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. I just think of Chan, almost like my name Chen, except with an O instead of an E. These elements are present in different proportions depending on the location. In humans, for example, oxygen makes up the greatest proportion of the four elements. In the atmosphere, however, nitrogen makes up the highest proportion of these four elements. So funny story, I used to live in Los Angeles, and when I first moved there, my friends and I used to do this thing where we would try to eat at places where we'd be most likely to see someone famous. So anyway, one day we ate at this cafe and across the street from where we were eating, because we were eating outside, um, there was a car repair shop and they had this huge banner, this huge ad outside that said, we will fill your tires up with 78% nitrogen, only $19.99 or something like that. And I remember thinking like, oh, is, is that good for my tires? I have no idea. I don't know anything about cars. But now that I know, I'm like, wait a second, they're just filling up my car tires with air. What a scam, right? Oh, man. So atoms are the smallest unit of matter that retains all chemical properties of an element. And if you look at an atom, in the center we have a region we call the nucleus, and the nucleus contains protons that are positively charged and neutrons that are neutral. And then outside of this nucleus we have our electrons that are negatively charged. These are subatomic particles. And if you look at your book, um, your book has a great example where they tell us where one gold atom, so gold, has all the properties of gold, like its chemical reactivity. Um, take, for example, let's say you have a gold coin. A gold coin is really just a bunch of gold atoms, and they made it, they molded it into a shape of a coin. Probably has some impurities here and there, but primarily gold. And we can't break uh, break down gold atoms into anything smaller while we want to keep the properties of gold. So if we do break an atom down, it'll no longer have the same chemical or physical properties. The number of protons, neutrons, and electrons are usually equal. So what I usually write is something like this. So number of protons is equal to the number of neutrons is equal to the number of electrons. But there are exceptions like isotopes and isotopes um, we have variation in how many neutrons we have the most common isotope of hydrogen for example is probably the only exception and is made of only one proton and one electron and no neutrons protons and neutrons are really close in mass so for our biology course, we say they're pretty much the same. The mass is defined as one atomic mass unit, AMU, also known as one Dalton. And compared to the proton and neutron, the electron's mass is so small that we just consider, it, consider them or consider it to be zero in biology. Looking at the charges, as I mentioned earlier, protons are positively charged. Neutrons are neutral or not charged, and electrons are negatively charged. So I always like it when I see these memes pop up on the, on the internet, on Instagram, or on Reddit. This one says, a neutron walks into a bar, and the bartender says, for you, no charge. Pretty cool, right? The number of protons an atom has is its, is its atomic number. And the atomic mass is the sum of the number of protons and neutrons it has. Although proton number has to be a certain value that defines the element, 
the number of neutrons can vary. Um, and that, as I mentioned earlier, forms different isotopes of the element. So if I ever wanted to calculate the number of neutrons, um, what I can do is, let me find some space here, the number of neutrons is equal to the atomic mass minus the number of protons. As I mentioned earlier, the atomic number is the number of protons. If I use the equation I mentioned earlier and I look on the left side, I can see that we have six protons here and the atomic mass is 12. So 12 minus six tells me there are six neutrons. On the right, I see carbon 13. And if I know that the mass is 13 and there are six protons, I know that there are seven neutrons in this isotope of carbon. If I look at the actual atomic mass of carbon, it's about 12.11, which is not exactly 12 and not 13. Why is that? This is because the average atomic mass of an element is calculated by looking at the masses of all of its isotopes, as well as their relative abundance in nature. As I mentioned earlier, isotopes are variations of an element that have a different number of neutrons. If I look at the bottom here at the pictures, I can see that protium has no neutrons, deuterium has one neutron, and tritium has two neutrons. There are both stable and unstable isotopes. And usually what happens is that the greater the difference between the number of protons and the number of neutrons, the more likely the isotope will be unstable. This is a screenshot of the simulation created by the University of Colorado Boulder on isotopes recommended in chapter two of our book. In this activity, you can select an element, change the number of neutrons it has in order to generate some kind of isotope, and see if it's stable or unstable, and it tells you right here. Here, the number of neutrons is equal to the number of protons, so the isotope is stable. The greater the difference between the number of protons and the number of neutrons, however, the more likely the isotope will be unstable. So I can see that here we have three neutrons that are gray and one proton. So this one is unstable. Radioisotopes are isotopes that emit energy. They release subatomic particles during decay that we can detect. So we can take advantage of this through something called radiometric dating. Sometimes this is called carbon dating if we're using carbon. Um, for example, uh, the type shown here on the left in this picture, the one that we use to date fossils is carbon dating. And we use carbon-14 to do, to do this. Carbon-14 is a naturally occurring radioisotope that we find in the atmosphere. And when organisms are alive, we're constantly incorporating carbon-14 into our bodies at a regular rate from our diet, you know, from the food that we eat. So the relative amount of carbon-14 we have in our bodies is equal to the concentration of carbon-14 in the atmosphere, right, outside. But when an organism dies, it's no longer eating, it's no longer ingesting any carbon-14. So the ratio between carbon-14 and the normal isotope carbon-12 in the body will go down as carbon-14 decays and it decays into nitrogen. The half-life of carbon-14, which is how long it takes for half of the original concentration of an isotope to decay back to its more stable form, is about 5,730 years. And because the half-life of carbon-14 is so long, scientists use it to date formerly living objects, such as old bones or wood. And what we do is compare the ratio of the carbon-14 concentration in the object to the amount of carbon-14 in the atmosphere. And we do this to determine the amount of the isotope that has not decayed yet.
So as I mentioned earlier, in living organisms, the relative proportion of carbon-14 in the organism is equal to that found in the atmosphere. But once the organism dies, it starts to decrease. Carbon-14 levels start to decrease. If we find only half of the relative atmospheric levels of carbon-14 in the organism, this means that the organism is approximately 5,730 years, which is the half-life of carbon-14. If we found only 25% of the relative atmospheric levels in the organism, that would mean two half-lives passed. So the organism is a little bit over 11,000 years old. And again, similarly, if we only found 12.5% of the relative atmospheric levels of carbon-14 in the organism, that means three half-lives have passed. So the organism is just over 17,000 years old. But carbon-14 is really only accurate for remains that are 50,000 years old or less. If something is much older, we use different types of isotopes, such as uranium, uh, potassium, or even rubidium. Uranium has a half-life of 700 million years. Uh, potassium has a half-life of 1.25 billion years. That's crazy. And rubidium has a half-life of almost 49 billion years. All right, so we looked at an atom and subatomic particles. In your chem class, you'll already have learned about electron shells, valence electrons, octets, electron shell configurations, those um, S, P, D, F subshells and orbitals. So please review these in your book if you need to, but we're not going to cover them again in our chapter two lecture. We're just going to jump straight into molecules, which are two or more atoms that are chemically bonded. All right, and that concludes the first part of chapter two. As I mentioned earlier, there are some parts in the book that I did not cover in my video, and this includes chemical reactions, reversible and irreversible reactions. So if you need a refresher on those topics, please go back to your book and look at chapter two. In the next video, we're going to be looking at chemical bonds and the properties of water. All right, thank you.